My name is Rennie Edo Lodge. Um, I'm a journalist and I am the author of the new book, Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. About three and a half years ago now, um, I wrote a post on my blog called Why I'm No Longer Talking to White People About Race. I wrote it uh, at a point of extreme frustration and despair, frankly, uh, after a few years of attempting to try and talk to white people about race and just really getting nowhere. I was frankly bashing my head against a brick wall. I wasn't getting anywhere um, and I was emotionally exhausted. Um, I'd found myself in feminist circles and progressive circles around people who profess to be really forward thinking, really right on. Uh, that's a bit of an antiquated phrase, isn't it? Right on, but anyway. And, um, but when I tried to talk to them about race and racism, it was just like a threshold that was absolutely, I was not allowed to talk about it. Um, I found myself being called the real racist. You know, I was told that I was silencing white people. Um, I, w I became the problem. So I wrote the blog post and I said that I can't have a conversation with people about the nuances of a problem if they don't even recognize that the problem exists. So I just press published, left it at that. Uh, and then when I returned to my website, I could see it had really taken on a life of its own. It was being shared more times than I cared to count. And it was really strongly resonating with people um, in a way that I couldn't even begin to predict. Um, and the response was also overwhelmingly positive. Um, people saying, you know what, Rennie, what you've done is articulated exactly how I feel. I've been trying to have this conversation for a decade. I've been trying to have this conversation for 30 years, et cetera, et cetera. And then there were also people who were saying, you've completely changed my perspective on this issue. Thank you so much. I carried on being a jobbing journalist. Uh, and then I found myself in the position where I was able to write a book. And when I had that opportunity, I knew I could write nothing but this book. It had to be a um, an exploration of race and racism in our society and how British society is shaped by race. Because I think that's something that we are in deep denial about. Uh, we often look over to the States and we're like, oh, well, you know, all the problems are over there. We never discuss our own issues to do with race and racism here. I know that when I was growing up and going to schools in and around London, um, I, when it came to Black History Month, I learned about the US struggle um, to the extent that I didn't even know about events, civil rights struggles that are happening in and around London and, and across Britain, you know, huge monumental things. You know, you have to ask who has access to write history in the first place. Uh, something that I write a lot in the book is essentially that um, there's problems even in the supply chain to find, to get people who are not white into positions of influence in the first place, to write the book, to commission the TV series about black British history um, or Asian British history. Racism is not coincidental. It exists for a social purpose to basically to compound power in the, the hands of people who are white. You know, that's the point of racism. It has a social point. And, and actually that's, uh, it's very effective as if you look at our bastions of power in this country. Um, there's barely anybody who isn't white in those arenas. So when I talk about um, white privilege, um, I'm not saying white people have lived lives of luxury and wealth. That's certainly not what I'm saying at all. You know, I basically grew up in poverty alongside many other white people in poverty. Um, but what I am talking about is the fact that if your name sounds British rather than African or Asian, you're more likely to get the job interview. It's as simple as that, you know. Um, so it's more about structural advantage and the cost of that is structural disadvantage. The 1999 McPherson report, uh, the inquiry into, you know, the catastrophic failures um, of the police in investigating uh, Stephen Lawrence's death, uh, came up with the term institutional racism. And that was about the collective effect of bias and how that essentially uh, marginalizes people who aren't white, you know, and it could be racial stereotyping uh, and, and sometimes just ignorance. And what the collective effects of bias do is um, create a situation where, let's say, 
in fact, let's not, let's say, you know, the facts show us that, um, you know, black, a black boy is more likely to be excluded from school than the rest of the school population, more likely to be, to be marked down by his own teachers at SATS level, so that's year six, um, less likely to get into one of the most prestigious universities in Britain. If, they, if he does graduate from one of those universities, he's much more likely to get one of the lower grades and the higher grades. If he manages to get a decent grade and um, starts sending out CVs, he's much more likely to um, wait a longer time for interview because research has basically shown that people with African and Asian sounding names will, work, will wait much longer to be interviewed. And if he does get the education and the job, then there's a racial pay gap. So we can see at frequent stages um, in his life when he interacts with national institutions, you know, healthcare, you know, employment, education, housing, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, um, he's disadvantaged. Uh, that's not me saying he's a victim or, you know, he should just give up. Um, and that's not me saying white people are evil, but that is me saying that there is a, he's at a structural disadvantage and that the odds are stacked against him. It's not easy to spot, um, you know, straight off the bat. It's not somebody spitting you in the street. It's not somebody calling you the N-word. Uh, for somebody who isn't white and isn't in that institution, sometimes it's just a quiet understanding of difference, of, you know, knowing that you are being treated different here, differently here. In the case of like a racial pay gap, nobody ever talks about their pay packets. People are notoriously secretive about that. So you may never know. Um, and that creates a situation where if you try to bring it up with your colleagues, sometimes your white colleagues, you'll be told, you're just imagining it. You're just imagining it. This doesn't exist. You've got a chip on your shoulder. And so that's really what I mean by structural racism. I'm talking about the big picture here. So I think that the way in which we have understood ourselves to be progressive and forward facing until very recently is just to ignore race, just to say, oh, we don't see race. You know, I treat everybody equally, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, I've lost count of the amount of times in which somebody will be like, oh, the black guy, you know, because they, they're scared about saying the word black in case it offends. Nobody cares about the word black in terms of offense. What I'm offended by is drastic racial inequalities because I think that it's unacceptable in 2017 that um, this is still the state of play, you know? I don't care if you call me black, I'm black. It's a descriptor, you know? I'm five foot five. I'm not gonna start crying if you say that I'm five foot five, you know? It's a descriptor, it's an adjective. Um, and so, and so color blindness is that denial. It, it is that skirt around the issue, don't raise it. And, and, and what it does is essentially create a situation where if you do start naming the problem, which is race and racism, um, then you become the problem. Um, I've received pushback from people with the, with the book, the title alone. Oh, you can't generalize white people in this way. But I think that's because white people are not used to being called white as a descriptor as a plain adjective, uh, nothing more, nothing less, uh, because whiteness is considered invisible in our society. And if you are considered to have a race, you're not white. There's a chapter in the book called Fear of, Fear of a Black Planet. Um, I wrote it at the beginning of 2016. And then I think that in terms of global politics, it really became pertinent. Um, and Fear of a Black Planet is essentially um, people who, on one side, deny the power relations of race in this country, but on the other side, are very, very scared of white people becoming a minority, almost as if they recognize that being a minority in this country means treatment that is not preferential. So it's almost like a bit of a double bind, Schrodinger's cat situation that they've got themselves into there. Um, I actually interview uh, far-right politician Nick Griffin in the book, and uh, when I asked him, but why do you think that, you know, white people becoming a minority in Britain would be a bad thing, he said, I regard that to be a racist question, uh, which I think suggests to me that there is an understanding there from people who might dedicate their lives, careers to white supremacy, frankly, um, there is an understanding that um, being a racial minority means 
means structural disadvantage. There is an understanding, no matter how much they might suggest to you that that isn't the case at all. And so I think that far right politics and its sort of resurgence across the globe is almost that, almost as the last dying cry of, uh, of monocultural society. Uh, but the fact of the matter is we are moving towards a more um, global society, you know, and, and I think that that's no bad thing. And I think that it isn't a bad thing that um, people from different cultures and different races are meeting each other and, you know, falling in love with each other and having children with each other. I think that's an interesting thing. We're all learning from each other in that respect. But the rise of far right politics, at least across, you know, Western Europe and in the US, uh, sees this as a tragedy. They think that they're losing something, but, but the people from those political parties fail to recognize that they are the dominant majority in their countries and that probably isn't gonna change anytime soon. So the book is for anybody who's interested in these issues, regardless of your race. I think that it's really important that if you care about these issues and you care about ending racism in our society, then you familiarize yourself with the ways in which race has shaped our society. Um, and uh, to anybody who uh, is apprehensive about reading the book because they're white, I would say, get over yourself. I mean, <laughs> you know, I wrote the book for people to read and if I didn't want people to read it, I would have written a little pamphlet uh, and uh, burnt it in my back garden or something. Even though the opening essay is me talking about my utter frustration, you know, in dealing with brick walls of denial, I know many a white person who not only is curious to know more, but also so, so keen for change. And, and I think that every, all of us have it, have it within, within ourselves to advocate for, advocate for change. I, I really do believe that.